How's it going guys? Red Spews back with you again. You may have seen a previous video of mine where I unboxed a demilled number one Mark III infield from the Ishapur Rifle Factory in India. I alluded to a restoration project that I was going to attempt with a sporterized number one Mark III infield that I already had. This rifle that I'm holding here is that sporterized number one Mark III. We'll go ahead and give it a quick safety check first. See there it is indeed empty. There's our markings. It is a BSA, which is Birmingham Small Arms. 1918 short magazine fed Lee Enfield Mark III star and everything looks good on the back end here is when we start getting up to the front we start running into issues. The wood should go all the way to the front side and actually a little bit past it. Also these notches here in the stock should have metal pieces coming out that go up to protect the rear sight and it most definitely does not have that. At some point the stock disc was removed and plugged with another piece of wood. So I picked up this infield a couple years ago at a gun show for a very reasonable price and I've always thought about well maybe I can get it back to its original military configuration and I've been looking for number one Mark III stocks for quite a while and they're always very expensive. Well, recently j and Sales came out with some Ishapur number one Mark III's that were in their original military configuration, but demilled and they're supposed to be drill purpose rifles. So not for actual function and shooting. Since all the functional parts of this rifle have not been changed from their original configuration, I think all I have to do is just change out the stock and the front hardware and I'll have pretty much an original rifle. Looks wise at least anyway. Of course the part won't be magic. Whoever sporterized also put this sporter style leather sling on it. I may put that back on the rifle or I may take it off. I'm undecided on that so far. This is the Ishapur rifle that I was talking about that I have a previous unboxing video on. If we compare these two there are some differences. On the back end here there's no kind of cutout or anything on this one but the Ishapur rifle it has some kind of cutout here. I don't know if that's going to interfere when we try to change the stock out or not. There's some wood removed here. I'm going to keep the front barrel band if it'll fit with my original rifle and we'll be putting the nose cap off the Ishapur rifle on mine. First things first though, this Ishapur rifle is absolutely slathered in Cosmoline and I'm going to do my best to remove as much of that as possible and then we'll start taking parts off the rifles and seeing what fits and what doesn't. So normally I would be doing a full Cosmoline removal of the rifle before doing anything else with it but since I'm a little skeptical on whether or not the parts are actually going to fit my other rifle, I'm going to do a bare minimum just to take the thing apart and see if the parts fit. So I got me some gloves on because this is very gross. I also have a heat gun just in case I need it. I have a little bit of carburetor cleaner as a solvent, some blue shop towels, and a nice little stack of q-tips. Let's see if we can get this bolt to come out. I'm just going to go ahead and turn this up and see if the bolt comes out and it does. There's the bolt head there. It is gooped up with Cosmoline. There is a ton of Cosmoline in the magazine it looks like. A ridiculous amount. So taking this magazine out might prove very difficult. I will need to do that next though. So I'm gonna try to just take off some of this surface Cosmoline if I can. Look at that. It's like thick, gross earwax. I think I'm going to need a few more Q-tips than I provided myself. This gun is so heavily coated in Cosmoline that I would really have liked to have let it sit out in the hot sun for a while to loosen everything up first. The temperature in my house is around 60 degrees right now. And anybody that's messed with Cosmoline knows that that low temperatures are not good for it. It really makes it super thick and hard to deal with. It is winter time though and it's only about 40 degrees outside. So sitting outside is really not going to help me very much. They really went above and beyond. Look at that. All from the inside of the action. Yeah, that magazine follower, it has a spring in it. It's trying to pop back up. It's so gummed up that it's moving very slow. Let me see if I can pull the magazine out. It's acting like it's wanting to come, so maybe we will get it out now. I had to push it out from the inside, but I do think we have freed the magazine. And there it is, our 10 round box magazine. And it has those red and yellow stripes painted on it. It might have actually been red and white originally to mark that it was a drill purpose rifle. You can see this is quite the show of greasy, waxy Cosmoline preservative grease. And my gloves are thoroughly disgusting at this point. Now that we have those basic pieces removed, we'll grab some more tools and see if we can't start unscrewing some stuff on this. So I grabbed myself several different sizes of screwdriver. This is the first time I've done a full disassembly of a number one Mark III. This will be a little bit of a learning experience experience for me. I've decided that I'm going to remove one glove. The plan is to have one clean hand and one dirty hand. Hopefully that works out for me. So we have the master screw here at the bottom of the magazine plate. It doesn't seem to be in there too tight, so that's nice. There's that screw. There's a screw up here towards the front that should be removed. There's a lot of Cosmoline down in that hole. 
I think that one's unscrewed, it's just not wanting to pop out. We have yet a, another screw further up. Try to wipe off some of the cosmoline around this one. Look, look at this. Dealing with cosmoline is always a pleasure. Again, that one broke loose fairly easily. I'm getting lucky so far. That's loose, but I can't get it to come all the way out. We're working right on the edge of our viewable screen here, but I will try to remove the screw that's holding on the barrel band. I have a smaller head screwdriver for this one. Also, not tight at all. This one does need to come all the way off right now. That front barrel band is hinged. Comes off very easily. I'll try to keep the screw with that so I don't lose it. And there's a little sling swivel. We'll try to take off our nose cap. This is the part of the process that I am the least experienced with. I can see we have a screw here. So we'll go ahead and loosen that up. Luckily that one wasn't super tight either. It's almost like they knew this rifle was gonna get taken apart. And that's sort of a long screw, comes all the way out of the nose cap. And now this screw on the bottom here, I believe is a spring screw that helps with the barrel bedding. It gives it upward spring tension. There's that one. Then that's all that holds the nose cap on. Let's see if we can get it to come off. Working on a rifle like this while on cam is actually quite challenging. You're always working around the camera. So I got a blue shop towel here to try to give myself some purchase. Wow, okay, so it came off. <laughs> I really thought I was gonna have to take the heat gun to this one, but it did come off. It looks like there's a lot of rust in this. We can see a little bit under the stock here. We'll keep those nose cap screws close together. And there is our front sight, coated in cosmoline. At this point, we should be able to take this front handguard off. We'll raise up our sight just to get it out of the way. Look at the wave of cosmoline on that. All right, so we'll see if we can take off this front handguard. Should just be able to wiggle it a little bit. And there it comes. There's our front handguard with health the amounts of cosmoline all in and around it. I'll have to thoroughly decrease that before I put it on my other rifle permanently. And there's our barrel there. This ring was attached by one of the screws that we were loosening up earlier. We should be able to take our rear handguard off at this point. Lift up that rear sight. And you gotta pull on this one a little bit. It's under spring tension. It's not wanting to come just now, so I think we're gonna leave it for the moment. I'm trying to wipe some of this cosmoline off of our trigger guard area so it'll be easier to mess with. At this point, there should be just one screw left before we can actually take that front stock off. It'll be this little trigger guard screw here. Very loose again, it's weird. It's like this rifle is barely held together. I'm not complaining though. It's made the process way easier than have to crank on stuff all the time. Pretty small little screw there. And this trigger guard should pop right off. There it is. Looks like there's some rust underneath that where it was meeting the wood as well. These rifles have been in storage for quite a while, I would suspect. I think the production dates on these were up until the 1950s and even in the 60s in India, they were still producing the number one Mark III. We're gonna try to slide the stock off. I was pulling on it pretty hard just a second ago, but it did feel like it broke free, and there it is. So this is one of the most heavily cosmoline parts I've ever seen. Under the barrel channel, there's just a big blob of it. Stock looks in fairly decent shape though. We'll set that aside. It still has the front handguard attached to the barrel to action here. I think I'm gonna try to leave that on this rifle and keep my original front handguard if everything fits correctly. I wanna keep the other rifle as original as I can. That's why I'm not removing the rear stock either. This also marked DP. Pretty much everything on this rifle is marked DP, the receiver. Mark DP, the front barrel band was Mark DP. If you're buying a DP rifle, four parts for another rifle, try to avoid doing it with pressure bearing parts. I wouldn't use DP bolts. You certainly don't want to use DP receivers because a lot of times those parts weren't properly heat treated or they were rejected because something was wrong with the metallurgy or it could be a number of other things. It's really not recommended to shoot a rifle that has DP parts. The only thing I'm changing out really is the stock and a little bit of non-pressure bearing hardware. So it won't be a problem for me if the things fit. That'll be the main issue, is whether or not I can actually get them on the rifle. All right, so we have our stripped down Ishapur number one Mark III. Now we're going to take off the parts that we're going to be replacing on my BSA number one Mark III. We're going to go through pretty much the same process with my BSA sporterized infield. We'll start by removing the bolt here. This one's quite a bit tighter than the other one was. We have that removed though. We'll remove the magazine. Hopefully this one comes out easier than the other one did. Yeah, it's a completely different animal there. You can almost quick change these compared to that other one. And we'll start popping these screws out. There's actually a lot more resistance on these screws than there was on the other one. The trigger guard plate here was actually backing its way out as I was removing the screw. There's the screw there. Go ahead and remove our little trigger guard screw. This one is very small. It looks like it would be delicate. Not sure what this white substance is that's down inside of my gun here. Last thing to do would be to take this barrel band off. There's our barrel band. There are some little markings on this one, and that's why I wanted to keep this barrel band if I can. We will remove the stock from the action. 
And there's our old stock. It does have some kind of weird white substance all in it, but I'll be cleaning that out before I reinstall it back on the other one. This is the only piece of the front handguard that's left. Whoever sporterized this, cut it down to this point where it should normally be at least twice this long. All right, so we have the rifles taken down to the same point. Next step will be to remove some of the Cosmoline on my replacement stock and handguard, and then we'll attempt to fit it on there. All right, so I got my DP stock at least clean enough to do a test fit. Now, as I was cleaning it, I noticed one very big difference, and I think it's going to put a screeching halt to the entire project, and that is the rear part of the front stock. If we look at the original one here, it has a notch cut out in it where the end of the stock bolt fits into. This was sort of a flaw in the design initially. It makes it to where if you remove your butt stock without taking the front stock off first, you can actually break the front stock because the end of the bolt nestles into this little crevice. Later on, that was changed, and I guess the issue factory went with the newer model and that's why it had that little cutout in it but as you can see on the back of this one it's a straight piece all the way across there's no cutout there's the two compared back end is very different so I don't think this stock is going to suffice as a replacement for me which is okay it's unfortunate I really wanted to be able to restore my old rifle this time I'm still going to be on the lookout for a replacement stock in the future and for now I'm just going to clean up this DP rifle the best I can because it's still a really cool rifle itself even though it doesn't function Function. It'll just be a cool wall hanger. You could probably modify this to fit. I think that this piece that's inlaid here is metal and not wood. You could probably grind on it some and get it to work, but I didn't want to have to modify anything because I wanted to be able to put this back in its Ishapur DP configuration if I wanted to. It has its own history and I don't want to go and destroy that history just to fix my other rifle back up, so I'm not going to do that. Just for the purposes of the video, even though I've already visually looked at it, we'll try to slide it on here and see if it fits. I'm almost certain it will not. Yeah, it doesn't, and that's super unfortunate because everything else seemed like it was going to be absolutely perfect. I was so excited to get my rifle back to its original military configuration, but this is what happens when you don't do 100% complete research. Seems like every time I try to do a firearms video of this nature, I always run into some problems. So yeah, it's safe to say I'm pretty disappointed with the outcome of this, but what are you going to do? Back to the drawing board. Well, if you stuck with me this long, thanks for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. I'll have more gun content coming in the future. Hopefully it won't be a disappointment like this was. So stay tuned and we'll catch you in the next video. See you then. Peace.